Welcome back to another little video. This one's a bit different. Uh, recently, Matt Russell hosted a Facebook Live conversation with me about the problems for musicians and artists generally working through COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, here are some edited highlights for your delectation. Welcome to uh, all those that might be tuning in. And uh, Pete and I are going to be discussing quite a big topic tonight, which is uh, really exciting. So um, we'd love for you to contribute to the conversation. So as we're talking about various different things to do with uh, the music industry and creativity in general, we'd love to hear your thoughts. So feel free to post some messages and um, let's see what happens. Of course, it could just be me and Pete and that's okay too. Tonight we have a rare opportunity to uh, spend a lot of time chatting about music and creativity and, and all that sort of stuff, which is uh, it's really exciting. Um, and I've been thinking about um, the topic tonight and it's actually quite a big topic. Um, mm -hmm. I think originally I thought, yes, there will be one simple answer. <clears throat> um, Pete will have that answer and it will solve all the problems for the entire music industry. Um, but uh, I've been mulling over it a lot today, um, and uh, it's a really big topic. And so um, I'm looking forward to sort of unpacking it uh, with you. And I understand you've got um, a few different things to share. Yeah. But before we get there, um, I want to go right back to the beginning. As a musician, as an artist, um, the creativity that you have within you has... Uh, been cultivated throughout the years and so I wanted to go back right back to the beginning really and just find out a little bit about where that first came from. Um, the majority of people tuning in will obviously know about After the Fire but was there something before After the Fire or did you put your hands on a keyboard and then the next thing you knew you were uh, you were in the band or how, uh, how did it work? Okay now well, there are a number of influences that I had that kind of pointed me towards wanting to be a musician um, and, and let me just preface things by saying that there are certain areas if you are in the music business or in any of the creative arts where the lockdown is going to affect you more than some other jobs mm. my influences interestingly it was a kind of a lockdown situation wow. because one of the very first things that inspired me musically was I was in a bath <laughs> and I remember it distinctly Aunt Violet and she was a maverick in the family she could play stride piano brilliantly look it up on Google if you don't know what stride piano is she played by ear she could play anything you name that tune very much of that era in the kind of uh, late 50s early 60s and and um, at the time my family didn't have a radio or a television and she um, said, right, you're having a bath tonight. It was my turn. And she put the radio on the end of the bath and she turned it right up, walked out of the room. There was me splashing about and suddenly... Da -da 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 and that was the kinks. And you really got me. And I was, I'd already started to play guitar. Mm. But suddenly there was, there was something beyond um, trying to learn Jingle Bells or... Uh, Bert Whedon playing a day. This was this was another dimension for me. Yeah. And immediately after that, it was the Beach Boys. I, mean, I knew about the Beatles, but there was some edge to the Kinks back mm. then that I thought um, I found really inspiring. So that those two things combined, dear um, bless her uh, Aunt uh, Aunt Violet, and um, a bit of early radio. The next thing was again a semi-lockdown isolation situation. In the school I went to, there were very strict rules where you could go during your lunch or your break time. And in the hall, there was a drummer and a guitarist playing. This, this, They both sounded back then really competent to me. But we weren't allowed as the, uh, you had to go into this um, lobby and listen from there on your own. Wow. You weren't allowed in the hall. No one was allowed in the hall. And I found that really inspiring. Later on, I got to know the guy because uh, they had this little cellar at the school where they rehearsed. And eventually, I was able to um, 
get invited down to this cellar and take my guitar because I started off as a guitarist I wasn't a keyboard player and he he could play a lot of songs in the charts and and I would hear these and that there would be this instant wow that's the right key that's the right sound it, it was just uplifting and so I learned a lot from that guy who sadly uh, I can't even remember his name but I looked up to him enormously. So that those yeah. were my real uh, formative inspirations. And, and meanwhile, music was going through all sorts of uh, cultural changes. At this time, the Beatles were were really happening. The Stones. It was sort of early early sixties. And prior to that, there had been these other. Had been rock and roll, and then before that, there was skiffle, which had moved away from this kind of dance band music, like light radio. Well, what was it called? It was the light program on the wireless in those days. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. So that's that's an introduction. Um, yeah. And and where we are now, of course, is is tricky because really it affects anybody that wants to play live in front of an audience yeah so creativity as in itself um hasn't really stopped and and um people are still creating but it's the um the delivery of that creation it's how how do people engage with it and all that sort of thing which has changed back then was that really uh on on your mind in terms of um i want to be in a band i want to perform i want to create things for people to enjoy or leading up to after the far was that uh, a happy accident um kind of what was that what was that journey i still didn't have a career <laughs> a career mm. plan then mm. it was yeah. it was more of um a wanting to do it and and um come on man i wanted to impress the girls i wanted to <laughs> i wanted to be noticed yeah absolutely Loved and cherished that's why I wanted to be in a band. <laughs> it's funny um, saying that many, many of you will know my dad as um, John Russell of After the Fire. And so I grew up um, knowing about the various different After the Fire journeys and all that sort of thing. And so there was already um, this uh, desire to be a musician because I'd, I'd seen, seen my dad do some, some things and all that sort of stuff. And I tried piano, that was no good. Uh, I tried guitar. Uh, fell out with my teacher, who was my dad, um, <laughs> and uh, eventually picked up drums. And um, I think there was something uh, just really special about the uh, performance element, I guess, which I was really drawn to. I think over time that has certainly developed, and I think mindsets and attitudes have definitely shifted because I think I probably went into it not as uh, innocently perhaps as as others I think I grew up with the MTV generation so I could mm. see all of these different things thinking this is a great career to pursue because you know it can achieve this that and the other and over time I've realized that's not really how it works out and actually there are um, greater things to achieve from from being a, an artist um, whether it be music or, or something else um, which I now fully fully uh, love and, and embrace um, but it's an interesting journey and to be able to be in a position to create something that people um, resonate with or respond to, um, it's an incredible feeling. When people are singing the songs back at you, um, mm. it's quite, quite an incredible moment. Mm. Um, no doubt you guys had that a lot um, and I've been fortunate enough to experience some of that as well. Yeah, um, I, th I think it's one of the most gratifying things to have have an audience sing your songs back at you yeah it's a very good reason to every so often calm down what you're doing on stage particularly if you're a rock band um you've, you've hit on a couple of things which um about where we are at the moment under under covid and i think that one of the big questions is for live performers and i do think for the artists that paint and and draw that this is this now makes it it's slightly different for any performing musicians and it's how do you stage a concert mm. now 
And if we come out of uh, lockdown in December and have a period of, that could be still under, under a fair degree of restrictions until these vaccines uh, become available, how do you stage a concert for the middle range artists? So the kind of the 100 to 250 size uh, a band that would pull those that sort of gig. So it, it could well be you want to have something to raise funds for charity for for the NHS for all, all sorts of things. How do you make that viable for each corner? So it, it's not just the promoter and the band. It's also how do you make it physically viable for the public to be able to feel a, a, a sense of security when they go to a gig while still retaining the feel good factor that a whole load of people huddled up together in a muddy field somewhere uh, yeah. enjoying a, 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 a kind of a, a universal band like, I don't know, the Proclaimers or something when everyone knows certain of their songs. And, yeah. and there's that that togetherness and that goodness for the soul. And I, I think that that's the big question. Like you say, do we need to make um shows viable but are we going to have venues left are we going to have artists left and and all that sort of thing um yeah it's uh it's a challenging to be honest i was really hoping you'd have the answer to that one um <laughs> well i think we can look at the things that have worked in the past yeah uh, and try and identify what things would work now mm. before we got together i wrote a, a a set of things that i used to do what i was doing pre-covid um how covid literally crossed some of those out instantly but what how i've had to revise so mm. i would say a third of them were just were just went yeah then another third I revise, and then the other third I'm looking at to try and work work it out. You're absolutely right about the venues and uh, the hire companies are really suffering at the minute. Mm. Venues have also gone through a process um, of development, and when mm. when I was started out with bands, you always took your whole rig in, you took your PA. You had this, uh, you had the mics, the mixer, everything. You took the whole lot in. And then venues had started to have in-house PAs. And now that's all that money all tied up and, and mm. uh, the venue's kind of static because the people aren't going in to drink. Then you've got the big hire companies. So you get to a certain level. I mean, what, the level that after the fire achieved, everything would be on rental and you would just have all that gear and the trucks and everything for that tour yeah you you wouldn't own it but now of course that's meant that everybody that invests in scaffolding in mm. um lighting rigs in trusses in cabling in mixers in speaker cabinets in rigs to lifts and uh, all the riggers they're all kind of twiddling their thumbs it, it's mm. it's tough and i don't know whether i've got um a solution that, as you say the answer we have seen some people in in between the two lockdowns that there were these kind of pods of scaffolding that so people were very bubbleized up in front of a in front of a stage so the green belt festival which i mentioned earlier that had to go online yeah and Hope and Social, they performed and did a live stream. So they were sending a mix from actually, a, they were in somebody's, it was a barn, effectively. They built some sort of stage. So they were socially distanced, no audience uh, apart from crew, and sending it out down to the Green Belt stream. And, and, that, and that was fantastic. And then they, they recorded it. Now, one thing I just do want to say about if you have got product out there, um, I think there are ways of supporting your product during lockdown. Mm. Uh, because one of the things that happened recently was there was a film which Dare Commissar, our version, a particular version, which is a 12 inch mix, and it's called Atomic Blonde, and it was shown on. on um, one of the terrestrial 
mainstream TV channels recently. And I've noticed that on the Spotify stats, which I, I noticed that you referred to, are 10 million um, <laughs> much more than that, of course. <laughs> uh, but that one has jumped into the, to the busiest track. Wow. Oh, that's cool. If there's a way that you can find to promote your material, I mean, I, I don't like the word promote, but if you can somehow enjoy a lockdown imposed method of performing your material, albeit in an unplugged or an alternative way, it will help your, your, your bigger picture. Yeah. Uh, however, a few thousand plays on spotify youtube and so on are not going to um pay the bills and that's the bit that i wanted people to see effectively what they're using is this is a channel to raise a little bit of funds and i don't know how successful it is for them but it is a kind of solution mm. by having the paypal me which um, allows people to make micro payments and if somebody coughed up a five or a tenner Brilliant. Things like Patreon. Have you ever come yes. across Patreon? Yes. Um, and uh, various different platforms like that, which have um, made a huge difference, actually, uh, to them as an independent artist, I think, both pre-COVID and, and during. Um, I think it's been a real lifeline. Yeah. Um, and so things like that have been, been brilliant. Right. Okay. So let, let, let's just give it a little bit more on the solution front. Or, or some some ideas that people could think about if they're in this dilemma and in this tricky situation. We mentioned look at things that work. Mm. Now, um, the band Pussy Riot, which um, achieved some notoriety when they landed getting struck off um, uh, Mr. Putin's Christmas card list, they were working under restrictions. Mm. Yeah. A different kind of restriction, but they were working under restriction, and they now achieved an awful lot of success, and you might want to call it infamy rather than fame, but mm. actually their product is really good. Their media raucous punk stuff is not representative of their musicality and their great theatre stage show I, I was really privileged to actually see them live and it, it, it is one of the most breathtaking experiences ever mm. so what can we learn from what can we learn from that uh, what can we learn from that joy of festivals festival mm -hmm. experience how can we yeah. how can we tap into the the, the good bits and, and identify what could be done um, because don't forget, people keep saying you can't do that. It could never be done. And now sometimes innovation, it trumps worrying about imperfection. Mm. We might need to deliver stuff that is not how we would see as perfect as as artists. And I, I would include um, fine art um, and art art in this as well as music. Sometimes we are very obsessed to get everything absolutely perfect. But what what actually is the audience or our audience and the world audiences also want to have music. They want to have art. It, it sustains people to yeah. listen to music. And when you look at what some of the uh, kind of really top-notch musicians what they've done from home when uh, I mean, you know, Coldplay did one and it was absolutely riddled with mistakes and um, cock-ups and, and all sorts of things Chris Martin did a, a, a delightfully amateur one but it, it nourishes people yeah and I know that you when we talked about um, before the idea of internet radio um, to link up with there's there's an awful lot of internet radios out there that bands can be part of um you can you can develop your own channels um for music you've got uh, bandcamp you've got soundcloud um you can get stuff up on to the big boys quite easily but why not why not work with bandcamp where you can have pretty much 90 odd percent of your um of the revenue that comes in mm. so it's well worth working 
um, with those companies. And right. Bandcamp at the minute is not taking any cut during the lockdown. Wow. So it would just be whoever the payment service provider, which is PayPal or whoever. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are solutions out there. It's just that people are, are a bit reticent to use them because there's, there is still an idea that you want to be this um, headline act on a massive tour of the world. Mm. Why not, he says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and there was a phrase that you really liked that I put on, um, on my notes, as, and, and that's a commitment to excellence rather yes. than an obsession with perfection. Yeah. Um, I think we can still be really good in what we provide, it might be more about the authenticity, more about the sincerity, uh, less about the virtuoso musicality. Yeah. Um, but some of the most amazing songs aren't necessarily complex or require a great, great deal of dexterity. And sometimes to, to really reinvent a well-known song can bring in a completely different dimension to the existing song. Mm. This is a danger that every musician can get into in that they think that you can do absolutely everything musical. <laughs> so, yes, we'd like you to come and play at our In the Garden, socially distanced, um, yeah. at our old people's home, and um, we'd like you to play songs from music hall days. So you have to be careful, you have to stick to what you're at, and that's that's how I want to end with. So it's a five-stage charter. So I'll explain what each of these images mean. Um, if I go to the next slide, and so we'll take that one. So the first point of the charter is to have fun. This will make sense in a minute. You might be wondering what on earth I'm going on about. The second one is to maintain integrity. The third one is to work within means. Now, this is a really important one because you don't want to do something that is going to cost you too much when you have got an opportunity to, for instance, use the free Zoom software to talk to other music exactly like you and i are doing now matt you're yeah, in yeah. in um, greater guildford and i'm in in a muddy island in in essex <laughs> so we're we're doing this we could have driven all the way and met somewhere in the middle set up a camera and <laughs> take machines and got a catering company in to look after our every <laughs> needs that sounds so work, with, work within <laughs> means is a really important one and then don't damage the brand. Now this could be, if it's a band, it could be the name of the band um, or something like that. But it, it might be you. It might be what you are about. Um, your brand name is Hit Them Drums. You don't want to do something, maybe become something else uh, like that um, uh, one man band because it, it, it it contradicts what you're about and then the last one i i think is you you want to make a difference now this can be a kind of major charity thing or it can just be cheering somebody up it could be doing what we're doing today we're, we're talking to um a modest number of people however let's hope that it gives them joy and it certainly giving us joy because and it's giving me joy because i can wrap it on for hours <laughs> this is my little um guideline and if we just go back to the images this is what i the little fraction there is key mm. never go below three out of five of those points yeah and the reason i say that is you might want to do a charity gig because the cause is greater than the cost it is to you individually because mm -hmm. you might have to drive across the country if it's a live gig. You might need to do something where you are not having fun and you are not working within means. But if you're maintaining in integrity, not damaging your brand and you are making a difference, that's your three out of five. So you can use that. Ideally, of course, you want five out of five. Mm. That's a much better way of doing things. So there you are. That Those are my um, 
those are my <laughs> guides to the life the universe and everything between yeah that's really great and i think uh it's a, it's a good it's a great tool to measure um moving forward because uh coming back to the the fear of the if buts and maybes from a session musician perspective the temptation is to say yes to absolutely everything um and uh Actually, I remember someone saying once that the the opportunities that you say no to are as important as the ones that you say yes to, and I think using mm -hmm. that charter you've just you've just uh, shared is is a great uh, measuring measuring stick almost. Right. Do you want to check any more questions that have come in? Uh, yeah, there's a couple here. Actually, um, good one here from Paul again, um, which I think. It'd be interesting to see how this slots in with your your charter and the question um he's got here is banksy how are you able to manage your time between what you do with the green party and your music business yeah it's a really good question well the, at the moment as far as the green party what happened last year end of last year when the election came up i landed being the candidate for parliament which was a, just a complete shock to wow. the system however i knew that that would go for a certain period and then it would end mm -hmm. so i had to kind of steel myself and 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 get through it and i had to apply the charter you're absolutely right and it probably was a two and a half out of five but it is very difficult there are three main things in my life in addition to all the usual family and um, church and other things that I do so there are three three key things and one of them is very very demanding and um, under COVID that's been particularly difficult and that that is a local politics uh, issue I've not been very good at um, time management on on uh, apportioning my time mm. so yeah I think we're going to call it there um, Pete it's been great to uh, hang out and chat about this sort of stuff um, and we could probably talk for ages about this sort of thing so I'm going to put it out there if anyone uh, wants us to continue the conversation um, in some form or another uh, let us know um, post some uh, some some feedback and, and messages uh, in this video, and who knows, maybe we can do do this again at some point. Anyway, look, Matt, thank you so much for um, being a such a genial host, and and thank you, wonderful friends and people. Um, that's lovely of you to turn up tonight. I appreciate it. I know it's yeah. a um, an interesting subject. So um, everybody and Matt particularly as the, as the star of the show. Oh come on now! <laughs> Everyone was here for you, Pete. I just got to uh, <laughs> I just got to be a part of it. <laughs> All right, everyone. Cool. Thank Take you. care. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to click on the blog to subscribe. The more the merrier and click on the little bell icon if you want to get notified and we look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers!